Welcome, I'm Father Mitch Packer, and welcome to EWTN Live. We bring you guests from around the world, and tonight we will speak with a Polish author, lawyer, and international affairs expert about Pope St. John Paul II and how his beliefs regarding liberty and freedom were rooted in his Catholic faith, and that's help to change the world. Before we get to that conversation, we want to speak briefly with EWTN's Ryan Penny about what's happening in the world of EWTN digital media. Ryan, what have you been up to this time? Well, thanks for having me on sure. again, Father. It's always a pleasure. Since the last time I was on your show back in April, we have added over 30 programs to our on-demand platform. But tonight, I wanted to just highlight a few. Mm -hmm. Blessed Pierre Georges Fassati is one of the most popular uh, 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 blesseds in the church in the 20th mm -hmm. and 21st yes. centuries. But up until recently, there really hasn't been a dramatic presentation of his life until this year. This past summer, we added the docudrama to the top, mm -hmm. to on demand. Uh, beautiful cinematography and compelling performances. It really is. Uh, capture uh, really uh, chronicles his life. And so yeah. for those who are devotees of Pierre Giorgio uh, Frassati and want to learn more about his life, they should go check out To the Top On Demand. And James the Less, which was EWTN's first rom-com, which was a total smash hit on our YouTube channel back in February, is also now on our on-demand platform for people to go check out. Would you try in English, what does rom-com mean? Ah, uh, yes, romantic comedy for those who aren't okay. big fans of the Hallmark <laughs> Channel. Rom-com, romantic comedy, total smash hit, people loved it. You wanna make sure you watch these first five episodes before the next batch uh, comes out in the near future. Okay. Um, and then two more programs I wanted to highlight, Purgatory, The Forgotten Church, is a fascinating documentary that highlights how scientific evidence surrounding near-death experiences lends credence to the church's dogma on the existence of purgatory. Yes. And one more, the kingdom within the, the desert fathers, those oh, nice. Christian hermits in mm -hmm. the third century who really were the foundation for Christian monasticism. Uh, it's a beautiful done a beautifully done documentary. For those who want to learn more about what's possible in our interior lives with our Lord, they should go check that out. Yeah. And then finally, Father, I wanted to remind everybody about EWTN's YouTube channel. When I was on the show back in April, we had just under 800,000 subscribers. And now, thanks be to God, we have 850,000 subscribers. Okay. I wanted to particularly highlight, invite everyone to go check out our YouTube shorts, which have been incredibly popular. And the most recent edition, was a clip of an interview with St. Mother Teresa that was conducted back in 1993, a never before broadcast interview that was recently acquired by EWTN. And it has gone viral on social media with uh, almost uh, 50,000 views on our YouTube channel and almost 2 million views on our Instagram page in just the last week. Nice. And it really, it captures Mother Teresa answering the question, what is, what do you think is the greatest cause of suffering in the world today? And her answer is enough to lift your heart and mind to Almighty God. Nice. So it's a must see. Cool. And uh, that's all for me for tonight, Father. That sounds good. Appreciate that. We'll be back in just a couple minutes with our guests. So please stay with us. Welcome back. Our guest tonight holds law degrees, one from Fordham University in New York and the other from the 
Stefan Cardinal Wyszynski University in Warsaw, Poland. She's also a senior research fellow at the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation in Washington, D.C. Her newest book is called A Pope for All Seasons, Testimonies Inspired by St. John Paul II. So please welcome tonight's guest, Monika Jablonska. Monika, thank you so much for being with us. Appreciate thank you so much. it. Thank you for having me here. You're from Poland, right? Yes, I was born in Poland. But you live in the United States and are a U.S. citizen at this point. Right. So um, th this gives a, a great variety of perspectives, looking at, you know, this saint who had so many different ways of appearing in our world, uh, both in native Poland as well as in the United States. But you actually met Pope St. John Paul, is that not right? Uh, yes, <clears throat> first time in, I believe, 1998. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to a pilgrimage with my mom and it was a very hot day in Rome. And, uh, but it was the first time I saw him. And then when I went to Italy <clears throat> a couple of years later, uh, when I conducted research to my um, master dissertation and I uh, focused on his poetry and drama and it was a beautiful journey and this is how my journey with John Paul II started. Yes. <clears throat> I started with poetry and drama but then step by step I learned more and I was just fascinated by him. He was bold, intelligent and, uh, and um, I learned a lot. Well in some ways that parallels his own life journey because as a young man he wanted to be an actor right he wrote uh, for theater as right. a Rhapsody young theater. man yes uh, right at the beginning of the german invasion of poland and he did, they did underground theater, theater. And that was fairly dangerous to do, was it not? Yes, absolutely, because um, they couldn't uh, perform, obviously. Um, they would be punished uh, by death. And uh, however, John Paul II was very active in the uh, theater and um, very close friend of, um, he was a very close friend of um, uh, Kotlarczyk. They were working uh, on different plays, uh, mainly their main focus was on romanticism and, uh, and then probably also St. John Paul II was talking a lot about Cyprian Kamil Norwid and Mickiewicz and Sophocles Antigona. And this is how it started, but um, as he later uh, said, uh, unfortunately I, I have to give up on being an actor because my vocation is is different well, and he, uh, he didn't really jump into the vocation to the priesthood immediately this no it was a slow exactly formation mm -hmm. through philosophy and theology so he was discovering God step by step and one day he just made a decision or he just got this call from God and became a priest and probably also uh, all his experiences arrive from his childhood and uh, you can find a beautiful testimony of his uh, classmate and neighbor from Wadowice, Eugeniusz Mroz, mm -hmm. who explained about uh, a lot about his, uh, his prayers, about his relation with father, about his household and also how he, grew, how faith grow uh, grow inside of him and uh, how he became a probably later priest. Mm -hmm. But father made a really, played a very important role in his life and he was the one who, with his mother, who taught him how to pray and it was the first introduction uh, to God, to Mary. And, and I, I think the role of his father and his mother died when right. he was very young but his father 
you know, prayed with him often, brought him to pilgrimages, or uh, to there's a very famous monastery not right. far from uh, Krakow, uh, and it, right. it's the uh, beautiful place for pilgrimage. Right. And it's not easy. You know, it is not easy for a man to shape, you know, yeah. a young man and his soul. But if you don't mind, I would love to read you a, just a little, like a few words by Eugeniusz Mróz about his father and the relation with his father to get a better understanding of his fate. And um, father and son were inspirable friends. At the time of the death of his mother, Emilia Wojtyłowa, Karol was nine years old. From then on, Karol Carol's father took care of his son and the household. He really took the place of his son's mother. He was a caring protector, a wonderful educator, and a faithful companion for walks and vocations. They agreed on most everything and understood each other perfectly. However, the father, with his full dedication and care, didn't pamper his son, but required order him and instilled in him a sense of duty and orderly intellectual habits. I believe that his father played a huge role in shaping the character of Lolek. Lolek was actually, this is how they call him, yes. Right. Uh, at home and friends, colleagues. His great personality, strong moral sense and academic achievements. That man gave his son all his strength. The attitude of this modest and brave father was a model of nobil um, nobility and duty, a role model for us, his son's friends. This, this is something that uh, especially uh, seems to have formed Karavoitiwa after his father died, right. which was a, a fairly sudden thing. He, right. Came home, uh, Karovoitiwa right. came home from work, right. and his father mm. was dead. Right. You know, and you know, so he was completely alone, alone in the world except for God. But yes. his father had prepared him for that relationship with God. Right. And one of the things that I think is important for our time, so many parents today think, well. You know, I'll wait until they're adults and they will figure out their own decision for faith when they grow up. But I don't want to teach them faith. This is a big mistake. Right. Because, because everything are, starts at home. Exactly. And you're robbing them right. of an element. You wouldn't say, well, I'm not going to teach them English. I'll wait till they're 18. They can choose which language they want to learn. No. You would never do that. Uh, why would you do that with the language about God? This is a very important thing that his father right. gave an example of. But children watch their parents, and uh, first maybe they copy us, and uh, but then this is how they come to the prayer, to God. They ask all these questions, and this mm -hmm. is how we form our children. Exactly. And uh, building their spine so they can be prepared for I say stormy season because um, so when at the moment when they will ca come to face the truth about existence of evil, they would know what to do and how to defend themselves. Yes, and, exactly. And um, so we parents are doing our best to teach them to prepare them for life, and um, and this is also what I do as a mother. I teach them because this is the first home is your little church. Exactly. This is the place where, where you teach them. You give them love, attention, but at the same time you teach them how to pray yes. and you respond to all their questions, even the most silly one, but they are all beautiful. One, what you've done, you, you were reading from a book that you wrote. Uh, it's based on a series of interviews right. with a really wide variety of people that had different kinds of contacts with Pope St. John Paul. I mean, you interview his photographer right. and his friend and fellow priest, Father Jeevish, later on Cardinal right. Jeevish, 
and uh, people that yes. knew of him from theater and right. the, the man who made the movie about him, a uh, man from a far country. Um, you know, these are a wide variety. How did you choose to interview these people? Well, that's a very difficult question because uh, sometimes just words are not capable to express certain truth. I think it was a very natural process. I wanted to focus on legacy of John Paul II, and mm -hmm. it was a very natural process. I met most of those people, and I knew that I would like to speak about Karol Wojtyla and later John Paul II, and the different aspects, and talk about JP2 from, like, a look at him from different angles, like mm -hmm. music. That's why I invited Placido Maestro Placido Domingo, uh, um, Cardinal Dziwisz, and uh, also um, Bishop Oder, who was the postulator in mm -hmm. the cause for beatification and canonization of process of John Paul II. But also his, um, his uh, secretary, Father Ptasznik. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, were also talking, uh, we were also talking about politics. And I was very much interested in um, to discover, to learn about uh, his relationship, uh, partnership with President Ronald Reagan, which really helped me a lot. Um, in my PhD dissertation. And, um, and yes, there are different people and they provide um, beautiful testimony um, about St. John Paul II. So we can learn a lot. Um, and among of these people is also um, George Weigel and uh, Paul Kangor, and, um, uh, but also people from, I guess, from the United States, from Europe. They are bringing like, a, their own experiences and emotions. Well, the one, one of the very interesting parts of this is Pope St. John Paul's relationship with Ronald Reagan. This was not just a relationship of a couple of world leaders who got along well with each other. There's more to it. There was a kind of depth that right. both of them recognized right. The moment was right to help bring an end to communism. Right. And they were both in the right place. Along, I have to say also Margaret Thatcher, the Prime right. Minister of England, cannot mm. forget her very important role in all this. But the, the three of them were available at the right moment. And you know, growing up in the 19... 50s and 60s, I fully expected that we would have ended communism and maybe capitalism both with a horrific war. But Reagan, John Paul, and Thatcher did it very peacefully. It's remarkable. Right. Well, once uh, John Paul II said that in the design of Providence there are no coincidences and um, I'm pretty sure, and we all know, that it was for a reason. It was for a special cause that, speaking about President Ronald Reagan and John Paul II, it was the right moment that uh, those two leaders, one of the leader uh, of free world and the leader of the Catholic Church, came together and contributed to defeat the evil of communism. So they were different, but at the same time, they had a lot in common. And I think that they had a lot of passion and courage uh, to um, also speak, be not afraid. Mm -hmm. And um, John Paul II's first trip to Poland uh, actually proves it, especially at the moment when he said that um, um, it is impossible to separate Christ uh, from human heart. I went to Poland for the first time in my life just two weeks after his first visit, visit to Poland as Pope, back in June mm -hmm. of 1978. Mm -hmm. I was studying in Germany at the time. And um, there's, uh, there's a quote I'd like to read yes. from uh, uh, Joaquin Navarro Valls, who was at the time the director of the Vatican Press Office, the Holy See Press Office. Uh, he did it from 84 to 2006, and he's, he's, one of the quotes I'd like is this. 
the single fact of John Paul II's election in 1978 changed everything. Why, in 1980, did they lead the way in Gdańsk? Why did they decide now or never? Only because there was a Polish pope. He was in Chile and Pinochet was out. He was in Haiti and Duvalier was out. He was in the Philippines and Marcos was out. On many of those occasions, people would come here to the Vatican thanking the Holy Father for changing things. Right. What was it in him? By the way, I, I had the wrong right. year. I, I went to Poland in 79, June of right. 79. Um, but he, the, um, what is it in John Paul's approach and his mind, what, his philosophy, his way of thought that helped him be such a force for bringing down dictatorships and often deadly ones, like communism was horrendously deadly, and bringing, helping people to seek freedom. What was it that had in him? Right, probably there are different uh, things. And uh, um, I can say about his uh, unique personality. And he was very spontaneous and he, he had the courage to say, be not afraid mm -hmm. to people who are really expected to get his courage and do something. And he said, be not afraid. And we can, as I said before, um, you cannot separate Christ from your life because only in him all nations and humanity can um, cross the threshold of hope. And we were, I was just, I was born in 1979. So I can, <laughs> I can speak much about my experiences, but, uh, I was just, I learned a lot from, from the book, so probably you will be the right person to, to say about people what they thought about John Paul II after his trip and what was the background, what happened in Poland. Mm -hmm. I said his unique personality and fight for freedom. That's why he found amazing friend like Ronald Reagan. They both knew that communism is, is evil and uh, and they share values and morals, and they know that um, um, Poland needs to be a free country, and also Eastern Europe, and they both fought for it. I think also, you know, having, uh, you know, certainly being a, a, an adult in that period, it became clear that communism had bankrupted the culture, not only finances. Right. It wasn't only a financial, that, that they'd also done that. You know, uh, as Margaret Thatch used to say, right. socialism is spending other people's money until it all runs out. And that right. gets repeated over. But it's also a moral bankruptcy, uh, artistic bankruptcy. You look at communist art, Right. Nobody wants it anymore. And Reagan and John Paul, Reagan from outside, John Paul from inside, inside. the communist world, right. saw that right. this was a hollow paper tiger. Right. And they recognized now is the time to wake people up to Christ and to freedom. Right, it was a hope. They both shared hope and they knew. I think that, as I said before, this is very providential. And maybe this is not only about them and their decision, this is a God decision. And uh, he brought all these people together for a reason. And it was that moment when we faced this martial law and we, and the solidarity mov movement started be forming and they decided to support solidarity. And this is how it um, started. And um, probably um, communism would collapse, eventually would collapse, but... But at what cost to people? 
See the, the freedom. Yeah. Freedom, absolutely freedom. Yeah. And uh, that's why John Paul II, be not afraid, brought people um, courage to act and just say no. We just disagree with all these things that are happening in Poland. They started, ma they started action. They manifested it on the streets and everywhere. And they understood, probably they understood that they cannot live their life without God. Yes. That it's not possible to do that anymore. Well, and this is, yeah. This was also where it was Pope St. John Paul and many priests and religious who were with the people hand in hand in courage. They would offer mass at the shipyards right. in uh, Gdańsk. Gdańsk and Father Popievushko right. in Warsaw offered mass, you know, many times for the people and was eventually oh, martyred right. by the communists. Again, their method is to kill people. Right. Death is their tool. And uh, this is something that, uh, you know, Pope St. John Paul also was working in the background, it seems. He was always helping to call people to action. This voice of wisdom. But also behind. to charity. Right. That's what the solidarity meant. Right, absolutely and also moral clarity and moral leadership. Yes. Faith and prayer. And he also probably woke up all these beautiful emotions in Polish people. Yep. And uh, that's why they started looking for God. And it was probably the beginning and the end of the communism. Exactly. He woke up something inside of those people. He said the words, or maybe two, but something really meaningful. Uh, to Poland and to other countries, Eastern European countries, that they were looking for freedom as well. Yes. Yeah. So we needed both of them. So they are not longer with us, but we still need their legacy, moral clarity and moral leadership. You interviewed also the wife of the uh, Prime Minister of Hungary. Yes. And she had the same, uh, a similar experience. She's, she was a Catholic from a communist country, Hungary, right. and sh she and her husband knew that when John Paul was Pope, he was for all of us. Absolutely. Not just Poland, right. but everybody oppressed by communism. Yes, absolutely. And we were all waiting. The whole world was waiting for his sign. As I said, his voice of wisdom who came from maybe far away, but maybe from close, from our heart. And he just show us that God means truth, and there is no freedom without truth. One of the other things I want to comment on, because your, your right. husband <laughs> wrote the introduction. Right. It's a very nice introduction, but Thank you. the theme of uh, this book is, is in the subtitle, uh, A Pope for All Seasons. And your husband makes reference frequently to the wonderful play and movie about St. Thomas More. And he talks about St. Right. Thomas More as a man for all seasons. Right. And if our audience hasn't seen that movie, watch it, rent it. It's, it's a fantastic movie. But you know, he, he talked about the Pope for all seasons. Why did you choose that as a theme? Well, uh, um I was just thinking that we need legacy of John Paul II uh, through the whole season, not only in the spring or winter, but uh, his legacy is alive. He's, he's alive, his testimony, and we need him for now and future mm -hmm. and to whole generations. So all these people can inspire us, and I wanted to bring all these people together because in a couple of years, probably they won't be alive anymore, but how our children and future generation can learn. So you can never get bored with John Paul II. No. That's why he's just so amazing through the whole season. Uh, and um, it was my first thought. And then we were also talking to my publisher, Angelicum Press, 
and uh, we just came up with with this uh, title and I think that it's, it was just perfect and right on time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One, uh, I mean, something I, I had done for 17 years on my Tuesday program was teach Pope St. John Paul's encyclicals right. and other documents. Uh, just going through that because I still believe strongly that uh, in terms of this theme of a Pope for all seasons, his writings are going to last through the centuries. They will be right. something uh, uh, on the level of St. Thomas Aquinas as a re very rich source of our Catholic thought, philosophy, and theology. And you know, it, it's, it's a great thing. The folks here also had experiences of him in their personal lives, that that right. teaching touched people in everyday life. And that's one of the other things that you bring out here in these interviews. Right, I just, um, as we spoke, I would like to uh, speak about John Paul II from the different angles and about other people experiences with him, with diplomats, politicians and philosopher thinkers. But uh, was the most important thing for me was just to show uh, the proper understanding of John Paul II. And I believe that all my interviewees helped me in this, to achieve this goal. Uh, to understand John Paul II is not only understand him from the outside, but I always say uh, that we have to understand John Paul II from the inside. So we have to go back to his roots. And we were talking about this small and little steps. We were talking about uh, um, Nazism and communism and his uh, John Paul II experience with, with uh, totalitarian regimes. And uh, we were talking about the theater. Uh, Professor Kazimierz Brown provided beautiful testimony about his experience as a student of Karol Wojtyła. He was talking about the theater. And, um, but we also have to understand uh, Black Madonna, Częstochowa. We have to go back uh, to um, his time he spent at the Jagiellonian University. Mm -hmm. And uh, I spoke to his friends. Uh, um, so I think that I provided like a different taste and emotions exactly. of John Paul II. Something exactly. that you can find, every single person can find something for themselves. Even they may mean they are, I don't know, they like or they don't like John Paul II, but you can find something about his poetry and about his philosophy. And um, there are 50 or close to 50 interviews. Yes, yeah, so plenty uh, of variety here for everybody exactly. to look at. So I, I have like uh, some of them, and we were also talking a little bit earlier about um, Mr. Zanussi, uh, the movie producer, yes. and, and uh, his, uh, his movie. Uh, and this is actually interesting, if you don't mind. Well, actually, we have to take a break. Okay. Uh, it's time for a break. But we'll be back in a couple minutes. We want to get some of your questions and comments, as well as more about John Paul. So please stay with us. Welcome back. We are discussing a very interesting book. Um, it's called A Pope for All Seasons, Testimonies Inspired by St. John Paul II. It's written by our guest tonight, uh, Monika Yablonska. And you can get this book at EWTNRC.com, where it is item number 8845. And you know, these are interviews with people that knew Pope St. John Paul. 
and we're affected by him. And we've been discussing some of that and the impact of him. So that, that will continue Thomas. on. But we have a, a, someone calling in. Thomas. Father, how are you? Fine, thank you. It's good to have you calling back in from Tennessee. What can we do yes. for you this evening? My question is for Miss Monica. Mm -hmm. uh, on May 3rd, 1979, Pope St. John Paul II invoked the Holy Spirit to descend upon his country. Of course, this was the beginning of the, of the end of the, of the Soviet Empire. And um, uh, I'm just wondering if she believes that or thinks that uh, Pope St. John Paul II was the key contributor to the demise of the Soviet Union. And one final comment, this, this was all done, I believe, was, and many do, this was all done through the uh, Immaculate Heart of Mary uh, as she uh, disclosed at Fatima. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. I think that's an important comment too. Monica, what do you think? Well, in my opinion, he was one of the key people who helped to defeat the evil of communism, but he was not the only one without President Ronald Reagan or Margaret Thatcher, or even Lech Wałęsa. I was going to say Lech yes, Wałęsa was exactly. pretty important. So there were more people uh, to collaborate, <laughs> if I can say this way, or work on uh, defeating, the, uh, defeating communism. And many hundreds of thousands right. of people Workers. who were working. Oh, yes. Lech Wałęsa himself was a worker you know, in a shipyard. These were not all highly educated, powerful people, right. but they recognized something was clicked. And I think yeah. he evoked them uh, right. to come forward. But also Karol Wojtyła was a worker in quarry and right. yes, uh, and uh, I think that he, well, he appreciated the value of work and he understood, he better understood all these people who came to the streets and they were eager to fight for their freedom. And uh, I think that it was also one of those elements who pushed him to do something for, for these people because he was one of them. He was working very hard in Quarry and then Solvay um, company fabric a um, long time ago. So he knew the value of work. Yes. and the taste of freedom and uh, because he arrived from this country yep. from the country terribly experienced by world war one world war two and then communism and i, I think also uh the, you you cannot separate the polish people's faith mm -hmm. from their love of freedom that's also true in American history, that there was something called the First Great Awakening right. in the 1700s, just about 20 years or so before our revolution. And it was that religious commitment that stirred up freedom. While atheism always squelches freedom, they, they it can't deal with freedom and doesn't tolerate diversity, ironically. Uh, they can talk about it, but they don't. Uh, this is something that was very important for the faith to be the, the basic ground of people loving freedom. And when people lose their religious expression, when they stop worshiping God, stop thinking about God and trying to grapple with him, mm -hmm. they lose a love of freedom. Right. I think that's a very important element. We have a question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? I'm from uh, Gambrels, Maryland. Good to have you here. And what your question is? Uh, Monica, there was a movie made uh, some time ago about the life of St. John Paul II. I was wondering if you came across or discussed the movie in your interviews, and if so, what, what came of it? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, probably you were referring to a movie uh, by uh, Mr. Zanussi. It was a beautiful movie. And may maybe I will respond to your question with a beautiful quote, actually. I will call his words, if you don't mind. 
Uh, yet history compelled me to make this movie as a kind of Mission Impossible project. Uh, I couldn't make a film judging his life. This would have been dramatic, but tactless. Therefore, it had to be a movie about a witness of history, a daunting and unpleasant task from my perspective. I knew well that many people would be disappointed by the film for its lack of gossip and partiality. And that, that movie didn't have, you know, the back, you know, everybody has gossip in their life. Right. And this is where what we should remember right. that gossip is a sin. Uh, but he, right. the movie is something profound. It gives the different parts of John Paul's life and shows a, a real depth to what right. was going on in his life. Yes, and he met him before, so he didn't feel comfortable to judge him uh, because he knew that he was a man through the mission and men who really want to change the world and he's ready for that mission and uh, what's the most also important thing is that poland has a strong polish catholic church and mr zanussi was aware about it and he said that he learned from this um, years and even days when he was working on this movie he learned about church and john paul ii a lot and he said i can't say anything wrong about this man He's yeah. just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And probably this is also part of the reason why, why he became a little bit closer to church, because of him. He yeah. encouraged him to yeah. come and learn and about faith and freedom. And uh, he offers so much. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and again, it's another movie that I think is beautifully shot. You know, the, the, the fil footage is really nicely done mm -hmm. and our strong i think ewtn played that uh in the past we showed that on tv we have another call we have anastasia in ohio anastasia what can we do for you today well thanks for taking my question um i've often wondered about this uh and when you were talking about reagan and john paul ii and how they worked well together I know, of course, John Paul was a man of great, great faith, and I understand that so was Reagan, but I just wondered how much their background in acting may have helped them to overcome maybe fears that they may have had and let them help them to present their views and to kind of, you know, hold, hold that front, that have that stability that maybe an actor's training may have given them to present their their you know, their views and their beliefs and, and to stand strong in front of people and in front of the people that they had to, uh, the leaders that they had to be strong in front of. And I just wonder whether she, uh, Monica, had encountered any interviews or has any opinion about that. So that's a, that's a question that I've had for a while, and it just came up when I listened to you talking about Reagan and John Paul, and I thought, wow, oh, I'm going to ask them if they know anything about that. So that's very my question. Good, so beautiful very question. good question, and Anastasia. What Thank a beautiful you. question. Thank you. What you address that in the book? Yes, actually, this is something they had in common, because they were both actors. They know the value of the word, and uh, they had this posture and strong voice and they know that the words have a meaning, so they have to be very careful using them. So they use the powerful word that really helped them to defeat the, uh, defeat communism. So um, I'm sure that uh, during their first meeting and conversation at the Vatican Library, uh, they were talking about acting and their personal experiences, um, John Paul II with theater, Rhapsodic theater, when the word has a meaning and value and brings lots of emotions but also um, contains so many um, different emotions and words and uh, and can be used as a powerful tool um, on so many different levels and i think that they both had this um, this perfect understanding and their skills um, reagan was a um, movie, Hollywood movie star. Yeah. 
and I think that they knew their diction and strong voice and the posture absolutely helped them uh, in um, in their daily life and I'm sure that it was very significant in um, defeating the evil. I forget which one of the interviews it was but one of them mentioned the way that uh, Pope St. John Paul, and this applied to Reagan too, they knew how to pause, pause. at the right time. They could put their phrases so that people they could using, understand yes. them well. And right. that makes a difference that you pay attention to the audience, right. not just getting your idea out, right. but how the audience can accept that idea. Right. Both of them had a good sense of that, I think. So probably that's why uh, also their own experiences in theater help a lot. So, uh, Father, you can now see how many things they had in common. Maybe President Ronald Reagan was not a Catholic, he was Protestant, mm -hmm. but his father was a Irish, Catholic Irish, mm -hmm. and uh, they both believe in God and then assassination attempt they both survived they, and they, they were talking survived. exactly and they were at the same year and they were talking about uh, destiny and uh, why did they survive just God um, probably chose them to bring freedom and Free. peace to the world exactly exactly so today we can just learn from their uh, testimonies and legacy and we are very lucky that we we can learn from all these amazing people. Some of them, unfortunately, are mm, not alive anymore, uh, like Ambassador Piedra. And, uh, but I was fortunate enough to talk to him uh, and to so many different people. And I think that the value of the book, I can, the book will probably provide even more information and show more about the legacy of John Paul II for the future generations. And this is what I really care about. Yes, I think it's, it's an important part. Um, you know, you, one of the important people you interview is George Weigel. Right. He, he's not always known to other people, but George Weigel wrote what I consider the best biography. biography. Right. It's absolutely brilliant. Right. Brilliant biography of John Paul. Why did you choose to interview someone who already wrote such a long biography? Because it's, it's a hefty book. It's a beautiful and large book. Why did you want to interview George Weigel? Well, I know George. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, uh, and also, uh, I couldn't imagine my book without him. He's a part of our history. And yeah. everybody knows in our world um, about George Weigel. So yeah. it was just my honor to invite him and other people who can contribute to making this world a better place to live. And, yeah. uh, and George definitely is one of them. And, and George also was someone who didn't write on the basis of news articles. He spent a lot of time right. with Pope St. John Paul. And also his employees and friends, yes. and you know, he collected all these testimonies and conducted interviews. Absolutely, and I want him to, him to be part of this project, mm -hmm. and um, and I hope that um, people will just get fascinated as much as they were his biography witness of hope. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. That that's the, right. again. If you're looking for a good biography of John Paul, a uh, witness of hope is uh, of by them, George right. Weigel, and it's a superb one. In I, I think uh, uh, something you did mention, we didn't really get into deeply enough, but it's Pope St. John Paul's love of the Blessed Mother. In some ways, the absence of his own mother on earth right. didn't crush him, but rather helped evoke from him a, lo a love of the Blessed Virgin. And this... Uh, you know, really guided his priesthood and his uh, papacy. 
uh, as a key element. He dedicated, he His consecrated. Life, tools, absolutely. Yeah, every Amen country he went to, to the Blessed Mother. Right, absolutely. Well, he was his mother. Yeah. He was the one who guided him and gave him a strength and probably encouraged him to do such a beautiful things in life he did for us through this 26 years of pontificate. Yes. And, uh, yes. And I know that he recognized it was no accident that the assassination attempt occurred on the feast of Our Lady of Fatima, right. May 13th, right. and that he survived. And he, uh, the bullet that struck him was, of course, taken out of him, but it was placed on the crown of her statue at of Fatima. Fatima. Right. Uh, and, and that just is part of the love that he had for and the recognition of her care for him. Oh, I think that's a very important part Absolutely. of this. Absolutely, and his trust in God and in Mary. As you said, he, he lost his mother and he needed mother and uh, someone who can stay close to with his thoughts and prayers. Yes, yes. And the, the other thing too about him with that, and we, we have to end pretty soon, but uh, I also believe strongly that by his great love of her, he helped to reawaken a devotion to the Blessed Mother. In the late 60s and 1970s in the West, devotion to the Blessed Virgin had really declined. It was discouraged because some people thought it would block ecumenism. He was so explicit and so in his papal uh, coat of arms, Totus Tuus was about her and his consecration of every country to her. He really helped to reawaken that Marian devotion just as he helped to reawaken freedom. I'm afraid though we are not free from the end of the time for this show, but I want to thank you for coming here from your home in Maryland and for writing this book, A Pope for All Seasons, Testimonies Inspired by Pope by St. John Paul II, written by Mon Monika Jabloinska, our guest. Again, EWTNRC.com has it. It's item 8845. And I want to give you all my blessing. May Almighty God bless you all and keep you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And again, we can bring you this program and all the other programs we have only because the network is brought to you by you. So please remember to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll pay our bills too. God bless you and thank you.